Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, and I'm also very excited to be here at uh, DEF CON. I never was, uh, was here, although I have several times watched the videos uh, off, off chains, so, so to say. Yeah. So, um, so this talk will be about Perun, our work. Uh, it's like a joint research project between the uh, Technical University of Darmstadt in Germany and the uh, University of Warsaw in Poland and several of my co-authors, so this is some kind of uh, academic work, so we published some papers at some top conferences in security and several of them are also here, sitting there, over there, and here in the front row, so we are very happy to answer questions later also. Okay, so as we have seen already today, several talks, there are uh, many exciting projects currently going on. People like do a lot of research and also development in uh, building different types of uh, state channel and payment uh, channel networks. So I would like to explain to you basically at a high level what we do in Peru. So uh, in Peru, essentially the goal is similar to the previous uh, two talks, uh, of Mo and Liam, uh, we are trying to build generalized state channel networks. And I will talk in a moment a bit in more detail what we understand about general state channel networks. Uh, the main technique that we developed in our work, and I'm kind of happy that nobody so far talked so much about this, uh, is about the virtual channels. So uh, some people also call it meta channels. And I will explain in more detail what actually are virtual channels and what are the advantages of these virtual channels. And a special feature, and maybe this is also one uh, distinctive feature of our project, because we have like a very strong background in cryptographic research, uh, we focus a lot also on not only designing these protocols at an abstract level, but also proving the security of these protocols. Okay, so we usually, when we come up with a design of what the protocol, a specification of the protocol uh, what it uh, what it uh, what it is. Then we also usually carry out a formal security proof that it satisfies certain security guarantees. Okay. So what is a, a state channel network? Uh, I will essentially show you our view at Peru of what this is. Uh, the basic ingredient, and you have already seen uh, this in several other talks, uh, we call them ledger state channels, and ledger state channels, they are built directly over the ledger, okay? So that's why they're called ledger state channels. Uh, so we have these two parties, Alice and Bob, and they want, for example, to execute some contract off-chain, for example, this could be some chess game or some other uh, online game or a payment or whatever, and uh, the ledger state channel then works in three phases. So in the first phase, uh, the parties, Alice and Bob, they have to go to the blockchain and create this ledger state channel. And hap this is happening with some kind of cryptography, like signatures are exchanged and so on. And then at the end, uh, parties, Alice and Bob, uh, I don't have a pointer here, Alice and Bob, they can like go to the, uh, send something to the blockchain and deploy some channel contract, which is later on going to be used potentially if there are some disagreements between the parties. So once the ledger state channel has been deployed, so it's established. The parties can then like execute contracts off-chain, so this is the whole purpose, of course. So they can, like, for example, run multiple execution of a chess game without ever touching the blockchain. And uh, as like Liam mentioned earlier, so we also support like this generalized uh, state channels where you can not only run a chess contract, but you could run s several chess contracts or like even completely other games also in this in this, uh, in this uh, ledger state channel. And uh, the main point here is that, uh, as you can see, that this execution of contracts, so this update of the state, this uh, is carried out off-chain. So it's carried out without Alice and Bob needing to interact with the blockchain. So then at some point when Alice and Bob, they don't want to use anymore this ledger, uh, ledger state channel, then they can uh, settle this channel and go to the blockchain, close it, and this again, requires on-chain communication. Okay, so this is essentially the three phases of a basic ledger state channel. Now we would like to extend this to forming a network. So this is the most simple network that you can think of. You have like Alice, Ingrid, and Bob. Alice is connected to Ingrid via ledger state channel, and Ingrid is connected to Bob via ledger state channel. And now uh, what Alice wants to do is she wants to execute off-chain a contract with Bob. Okay, so how can she do this? Uh, there are several options to achieve this. The first option would be, of course, 
we just have seen like ledger state channel, so we could just use this, okay? So we could just uh, create a new ledger state channel between Alice and Bob. But this, of course, has some disadvantages because, uh, as you saw, like creating a channel, ledger state channel, this requires interaction with the blockchain. So I need to communicate to the ledger, deploy this contract. This is slow, so it takes some time. It is also expensive because, like, deploying a contract takes costs a lot of fees. So we would like to avoid this. Uh, so another option is because we have these two channels between Alice, Ingrid, and Ingrid and Bob, we could use this existing infrastructure to let Alice and Bob directly execute contracts between them by using these two underlying ledger state channels. Okay, so, and this is, of course, the advantage that this can be fast. If we manage to design such a protocol, it can be fast. It can also be cheap because it, it does not require any communication with the underlying ledger. And this is essentially what we do in uh, Peru. So we de developed a technique that we call virtual channels. Uh, and the main idea is uh, you can think of these underlying ledger state channels as a, like a two-party blockchain. Okay, so the ledger state channels between Alice and Ingrid and the ledger state channel between Eng Ingrid and Bob, they offer you something similar to what the blockchain offers you. So how can uh, we now create a virtual state channel? So essentially also this works in three phases. Uh, in the first phase, in the creation of the ledger state channel, we uh, run a protocol between Alice, Ingrid, and Bob. Now there are three parties involved, okay? Ingrid kind of takes the role of the blockchain to some extent. And uh, this is off-chain. So the communication between the, the parties is, is going on like off-chain without touching the blockchain. So it can also be very fast, of course. And then uh, you can compare this to ledger state channels. There the creation was on-chain, so it took potentially a lot of time. Now, uh, executing, executing is very similar to ledger uh, what happens in ledger state channels. So Alice and Bob, they can now execute uh, multiple contracts off-chain. So also here we can allow contracts, several contracts potentially to be executed off-chain. And uh, finally, when Alice and Bob, they don't want to use any more their channel, then they can close it uh, by, again, uh, not going to the, to the blockchain, not going to the ledger, but going to the underlying ledger state channel. Okay, and again, this has the advantage that all of this here, as you can see, all of this create, execute, and close, all of this happens off-chain without interaction with the ledger, which is in contrast to the ledger state channels. Now, uh, this is very nice, but we, of course, would like to, con uh, to also capture, capture more complicated networks. So, like here, we have a much more complicated network, or like a little more complicated network, and we want, for example, that Alice wants to uh, talk to Dave. Okay, so how can they do this? We can just apply this technique that I just to uh, told you, you about recursively. So we could uh, let Alice first create a, a virtual state channel with Bob. Then over the virtual state channel uh, between Alice and Bob, Alice can now create another virtual state channel uh, with Claire. And then this can be continuing like this until uh, finally Alice have, ha has reached uh, Dave. And then they can execute in this final channels, they can execute their contracts off-chain. So what are the advantages of uh, channel virtualizations? There are several uh, of them that I would like to highlight. Uh, first of all, this is uh, a low cost. So since the intermediary is not involved anymore in the execution of the, 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 the contract, similar to the ledger state channel, where the blockchain is not involved uh, in the execution of the contract, this can be very fast and it can also be cheap. So they, in particular, the, the intermediary does not necessarily need to ask for fees. We also have better privacy, so uh, because the intermediary does not know what happens in the individual state channel, uh, Alice and Bob can keep their state updates private. And there is, of course, another advantage, there's no availability required. So even if Ingrid goes offline for a while, then Alice and Bob can still continue playing chess, okay? which is, of course, a nice feature. So now you have seen uh, a basic uh, idea of how we construct uh, generalized state channels. Now, uh, or like what are actually generalized state channels? You would like, of course, to know how we can construct them. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot explain in detail how this works now because it would take quite a lot of time. And we can, I would refer, like to refer you to our papers, which are on the webpage that was mentioned on the first slide. The one thing that I want to explain to you 
is uh, what happens in the case of corruption. So corruption makes, as we all know, our life more difficult, and uh, this is also why designing such protocols gets quite complex. So we have uh, the first case, the first example that I would like to look at, uh, at uh, with you is now the following. So we have Alice, Ingrid, Bob, and Claire. And Alice wants to play chess with Claire. So Alice can uh, open a virtual state channel between uh, Alice and Claire by using this recursive approach that I just explained. And then she can open a chess contract, and maybe in this chess contract she did some several moves, okay? She played very smartly. And at the end, uh, she is in state n minus one, and there's only one state left such that she finally wins the game. Okay, so uh, Alice has to submit to execute to the next state, and then she will win. But now, of course, uh, Claire and potentially also other parties, they don't have any interest in this. Okay, so they can turn corrupt and try to prevent this. They disappear, like uh, just in this example that Mo showed on his slide. Uh, they disappear, and then uh, we still have to finish, finalize this uh, execution because we want to have a secure protocol. So how can this work? Uh, at a very high level, of course, it's, it gets very technical because of there are many side, side cases that we have to deal with. Essentially, Alice first tries to execute the contract in the underlying virtual channel between Bob. If this also fails, because in my example, Bob is also corrupt, and essentially everybody can be, the protocols have to work even if all parties are corrupt except for this single party here. And if this also fails, then she goes to the next underlying ledger state channel here. She tries to execute to the next state in this. And then finally, if also Ingrid is corrupt, she goes to the, to the, to the underlying ledger. Okay, and of course, we trust Ethereum, we trust Vitalik, uh, so we will get uh, eventually, we will get eventually uh, the execution done, okay? So, this is the first example that I would like to look at. So now let's look into the next uh, example. Uh, how can we deal with the corruption case when Alice and Bob are corrupted and they try to cheat Ingrid and try to steal her money. So they want to steal some ease from, from her. And this is like a kind of can be a difficult case. So for example, consider the, the following situation. We have a, again a virtual, uh, led, a virtual state channel between Alice and, and Bob. And uh, we are having a, we run a contract, and this contract has the following property that if state n minus one, in state by n minus one, it pays five e's to Bob, and in state n, it pays five e's to Alice. Okay, so now what Alice and Bob can do to try to cheat uh, Ingrid for her money, they could try to submit in the underlying ledger state channels, because I said these underlying ledger state channels take the role of the blockchain. They submit in these underlying ledger state channels these conflicting states. And this would result in the following situation. If you don't design a carefully uh, developed protocol, then it would result in the situation that Alice, uh, the, the corrupted Alice wins five coins, the corrupted Bob wins five coins, but Ingrid, who just, who's just played the role of the intermediary, she was not even involved in this contract, she loses 10 coins. Okay, so this is something that we want to prevent, and we can do this by using uh, or by developing a carefully designed protocol, in particular using timings or carefully chosen timings to deal with these special cases. Uh, unfortunately, this is like very simple cases only, and it gets much more complicated in our situation. So we have this complicated network, and now we want to ha handle also full concurrent protocol execution. So many things can happen in parallel. Parties can open contracts in parallel. For example, here, this middle party here, she is involved in two uh, virtual uh, state channels, and she runs possibly several contracts in them in parallel. And there can also be many uh, corrupted parties, and of course, we want to deal with this situation. Okay, so we want to design a protocol that even is secure when there are so many corrupted parties, when so many things happen in parallel, when these, all these messages are exchanged, and the protocol should guarantee secu the security requirements that we specified. So how can we design such a complex protocol? And uh, for this, we rely on what uh, is uh, essentially the approach of modern cryptography, which uses what I mentioned in the beginning, security proofs to kind of design the protocol using a sound methodology. So this uh, approach of modern cryptography, which we use essentially for designing cryptographic protocols, uh, like whatever, encryption schemes or more complicated schemes, uh, it works like this, that uh, you first specify what is your security definition. So you, what do you want that the protocol actually should achieve? Then we design the protocol. So we come up with a candidate scheme that hopefully achieves the security definition. 
And once we have uh, done this, then we prove its security. Okay, so uh, at a point, uh, so, okay, we prove its security. So uh, at the point then, of course, this process is not like so nice as I showed to you here, okay? It's like iterative, okay? So uh, we sometimes, uh, we come up with a candidate scheme, we find some problem in this candidate scheme, so when we try to prove it, so the proof goes, fails, okay? So that's the nice thing about it. It gives you a sound methodology, to, so to say. So the proof fails, we have to adjust the protocol, and then uh, we try to again prove it, we fail, we try to again prove it, uh, so we, try, we adjust it, we try to again prove it, and so on and so forth. And at some point, hopefully, uh, then we have a security proof that our protocol our protocol specification guarantees the security requirements that we have specified earlier in this definition part. So this is uh, the main benefits of this approach is that it provides a sound methodology for designing complex protocols and it also prevents insecure ad hoc design. So there is like, a, maybe some of you have heard about it, there is like a, this protocol, or of this probably most of you have heard about TLS, okay? And it was designed in an ad hoc way without, having, without using this kind of approach of modern cryptography, of proof, provable security. And it turned out that there are many kind of bugs in this protocol, okay? So there are many people found problems, and now they're trying to fix it. It's a kind of a cat and mouse game, and we want to prevent this from the start. And actually now in the new version of TLS, people decided to use security proofs to develop the protocols. So we believe that we should also do this from the, from the start, with something as complicated as state channel networks. So what is our uh, basic framework to use this? This is uh, the called the Universal Composability Framework, and some time ago we gave, a talks, we gave some talks at uh, a workshop uh, in, in Berlin, and everybody liked this Universal Composability Framework, so I would like to mention it here as well. So this is basically how we kind of define security, what actually security means, okay? So, so we have these two worlds, the ideal world and the real world, the ideal world is some kind of abstract specification of what kind of security properties the protocol should satisfy. Okay, so it's very simple. It just can be written maybe on half a page. Yeah? So it's a very simple specification of what this protocol achieves. And then the protocol can be like pages long. Maybe in our case it was 20 or I don't know, whatever. So and uh, now we would like to show that actually this protocol has the same security features than this very compact description, this very compact RP description of the specification. And this is done by uh, what is called a UC proof, a universal composability security proof. And this essentially reduces complex protocol to something as simple as this ideal functionality. So before I run out of time, I want to uh, quickly uh, talk about some extensions and, implement uh, and also briefly about implementation. Uh, so we uh, recently, worked on some follow-up of our uh, original Peru network uh, paper, and uh, we extended it to also cover or to also support multi-party state channels. So what is a multi-party state channel? We have now the situation Alice, Bob, Carol, David, and Alice, Bob, and David, they would like to execute some multi-party contract, okay? like maybe a game that involves, poker game that involves three players. And they can do this as follows. They build first a virtual channel between Bob and David, virtual state channel between Bob and David, that's what we already have seen in this talk. And then over uh, this virtual state channel and uh, the underlying ledger state channel between Alice and Bob, they can create a multi-party state channel, and in this, in this one then they can uh, deploy a gaming contract, a multi-party gaming contract. So about the implementation, we are uh, cooperating with the company Bosch uh, to provide an open source implementation for Ethereum. Uh, of course, we're also happy to cooperate with other people. Uh, we are like a, a research project mainly at the moment. Uh, the, uh, I talked to our colleagues from Bosch and they are currently developing the node software for ledger state channels. Uh, they will release this in, uh, at the end of this year uh, as an open source project. Uh, then in uh, Q, so in the second uh, uh, half, or in the first half of, of 2019, the, we will, uh, they will release uh, an implementation of the virtual state channels and the hub software. And uh, then uh, later, at the end of the year, they plan to integrate it in some industry use cases. Okay, so this is uh, for the implementation at the moment. We are, of course, happy to, like this will be open source uh, released uh, soon, and it would be great if people here collaborate on this with us. So uh, let me conclude my talk. Uh, so what we are trying to build is uh, provably secure layer two solutions 
We will also look into other, possibly soon, other solutions like Plasma and so on. And uh, we believe that uh, to make them ready for mass for massive usage, they should there should be solid foundations for these protocols. Okay, so, and I just explained to you at a very high level what this is, like giving these definitions, making uh, the protocol specification really formal and releasing it to the public, and then proving the security. So this is essentially what we did. We designed a protocol, it's out there, you can go to our webpage, you can read it, and it's, it's really, uh, like I think, fully described, so you can like take it and implement it well, maybe not tonight, but maybe in five nights, okay? So uh, then uh, you can, uh, then we have security proofs. We prove that these protocols are secure. And uh, the next step that we would like to do is, because these proofs are quite complicated, very involved, like many corner cases we have to take care of, we would actually like to formally verify them by machines. So there are some kind of tools like EasyCrypt and so on. And we would like to use, to use them to verify that actually our proofs are correct. We, of course, hope that they are correct already, but better to let them check by a machine. This is what we are currently doing. We want to, in the future, work more on implementations, and in particular, this is maybe a long-term goal, also provide some formally verified uh, implementation. And of course, it's, it's very necessary to start with a sound protocol before you like, implement something as complicated as this, because if you make mistakes at the protocol level already, then uh, you don't need even to formally, formally verify your implementation. So uh, that concludes my talk. Further information are here. I would like to thank all our sponsors here that support our research, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Hello. So when you're <coughs> writing these um, protocol specs, do you basically like specify or come up with uh, a set of failure modes and then prove that those failure modes can happen? And if so, then then of course there might be failure modes that you did not think of, right? Yes. And another question is, uh, which frameworks are you using? Like what uh, protocol specification languages and proving languages are you using? Or so, uh, so the first question, was if there can be corner case. I mean, like, the, of course, what we do is, like, we have a, a specification of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the protocol. Okay, we give this. Then we have also a model. And then we showed that uh, whatever an adversary can do in this model, he will not succeed, whatever this means. For example, he will not be able to steal money from the intermediary. Okay, like, whatever his behavior is, as long as he behaves as specified in the model. So all this kind of stuff that we heard today, like replay attacks and this kind of stuff, this is all covered by our model, automatically by this UC framework. But other stuff maybe is not covered, like for example, side channel attacks, okay? If there is some kind of adversary who tries to break it by doing some side channel attack, or I don't, I don't know, some other stuff, this is then not covered by our, our model and we would have to extend it. Also currently in our model, we don't really like uh, have integrated fees yet. So this is something also that we would like, so gas, we don't have this. Uh, pro we don't have this formally modeled yet, and this would also be some next step. The second question was. Well, yeah. Second part was just that which uh, frameworks ah, yeah, are you using? So yeah, we, 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 at the moment we have like some abstract specification of the so like kind of pseudo code of the protocols. Okay, so it says okay, party A creates a signature, sends it to Bob. Then Bob does something, waits five seconds, uh, creates a signature of this, sends it to Alice, and so on. So there is something like this. It's like a, like a pseudocode, essentially, but we are trying now to move it closer to something like a formal language that can then be checked by these automated tools. Okay, so, so you haven't like written anything like uh, Promela specification, like, uh, like temporal no, logic? No, we, don't have, we ha have not written it in COC yet or something like this. Okay. But we want to, yeah, we will do this. We are working on this. We're also here, uh, so you can catch us later. All right, thanks, Bastian.